Uh, it's a misconception that cooking oil is a waste product. Traditionally, it's uh, a restaurant would pay a, someone similar to a garbage hauler to come get it and take it away. In the past five years, the whole industry has been flipped upside down and it's become a paid commodity. Well, restaurants now are actually compensated for someone to come pick up their oil. They, they, are, they are paid for that oil. Um, largely, that cooking oil is consolidated in Tacoma and been shipped over to Asia for soaps and cosmetics as well as used as cattle feed. Biodiesel is now kind of disrupts, disrupting, excuse me, biodiesel is now disrupting that old existing business model and interrupting that supply stream and now it's diverting that cooking oil here. Most of our oil comes from restaurants in the Pacific Northwest. Over 95% of our incoming feedstock to make biodiesel is from recycled cooking oil. The balance is from local area farmers. Uh, some of our primary restaurant partners is Kettle Foods, they make the famous Kettle Chips, as well as Burgerville, other local restaurants and food establishments. In biodiesel, people get confused with terminology. We say B something to relate to the purity of the product. So B100 is 100% biodiesel, B5 is 5% biodiesel, B20 is 20% biodiesel. Biodiesel really is interchangeable with petroleum diesel in that you can run any, any mix you want. You can run B52 if you wanted to. But the industry has kind of standardized and offered a B2 blend, a B5, a B20, and a B100. So here we produce B100 exclusively. We produce no petroleum. When it goes downstream from here, it gets mixed in with petroleum. A um, little bit of an oddity in that. B99.9 .9 is a very common product as well in the Pacific Northwest because of some tax incentives that have been in place uh, that when you put in one one thousandth of a gallon of petroleum diesel it would give you this good credit. Um, that credit expired this last year but we're hoping it's going to come back. And one of the biggest barriers we have is getting people to understand that biodiesel is pour and go ready with most diesel technology, especially up to a B20 blend. In the Pacific Northwest there's cold weather considerations with higher blends. Um, the product will congeal in your fuel tank if it gets down near freezing. The only real treatment we know of is to add petroleum diesel into it. So we've come up with kind of some blending criteria based on how cold it is, that once it starts to get below 40, start blending at least B50. Um, around 30 degrees, start blending B20. And uh, gets much, much below 30, consider going to a lower blend for the cold snap that is there. Our research at OSU involves uh, conversion technology, developing conversion technology for the second and third generation biofuels. So in essence, we are trying to convert the agricultural residues, such as grass straws that are available in uh, Oregon, into ethanol. And we're also investigating the third generation uh, uh, biofuels, technologies to produce third generation biofuels uh, from algae and uh, we are trying to produce biodiesel, ethanol, and other uh, co-products from the algae too. We are working on production of biofuels from biomass, essentially. And what we mean by biomass is uh, grass straw, wheat straw, and uh, yard debris, forest residue, and any kind of plant matter that you see around. And that's not used for something productive. That's what we call as uh, residual biomass. And at Oregon State University, in our lab here, we are trying to develop technologies to convert that into ethanol. This ethanol can be used in lieu of gasoline and to power our cars. The whole process of converting biomass into uh, ethanol involves uh, multiple steps. This one is grass straw left after the grass seed production. These type of feed stocks can be used to produce ethanol. First step is to get size reduction. First we clean this biomass, grind this biomass to this particle size. The whole process involves three main steps. First one is taking the biomass and pre-treating that so that we can prepare the biomass for further set steps. And this pre-treatment process is essentially to open up the structure of the biomass. So that's the step known as pre-treatment in which we try to break down this structure using some chemicals using or, or using some biological agents or using some physical method so that we break down the structure. This is the picture of a raw biomass that is not pre-treated and we can see that it's like totally packed and we cannot see any cellulose, it's just a covering that we can see on the top. And this is the steam exploded ones, even this we can see the structural breakdown of uh, the biomass. As we see that after pre-treatment we got this slurry in which we have solid and some liquid portion. So what we, we are assuming and what happens is, means during this pre-treatment or any pre-treatment, we are assuming that the structure that was closed, it is broken down now. So most of the hemicellulose comes in the liquid part and cellulose in which we are interested is still in the solid part. 
And then once we open up the structure of the biomass in the pretreatment process, we take that and then we hydrolyze that and convert all the long chain polymers into sugars. And after the hydrolysis step, the third key uh, step in the whole process is the fermentation process where we convert all those sugars into ethanol. Here you can see a bioreactor where we use yeast to ferment the glucose and uh, xylose into ethanol. This is a distillation process and what we do is we take um, the sample that's fermented and we put it in this flask here to become boiled and what gets extracted is ethanol which goes in this flask over here. One of the reasons why we are converting the biomass into ethanol is because we are running out of fossil fuels. Green Science Oregon is brought to you by Oregon State University, where faculty, students, and research are powered by Orange. Have an idea for an episode of Green Science Oregon? Send it to us. Go online to greensciencesoregon.com and click on the contact page. There are many advantages to this. One, for one, it is uh, there is a security issue that we don't have to bring in fuel from other countries. We can grow the fuel locally here. And that also means that we can have jobs locally. And uh, we develop the technology here, so that gives us an advantage as a knowledge, technolo knowledge economy. And uh, that is friendly for the environment, so we reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. That's the third advantage. And the fourth advantage is, of course, that we don't have to depend on the fossil fuels. To give you an example of uh, productivity uh, from biomass, for every ton of grass straw, for example, we can con uh, con when we convert it into biofuels, we can produce anywhere between 60 to 90 gallons of ethanol. And this can be used almost on a uh, equal basis, on uh, volume by volume, about 70% basis to replace the gasoline. And if we want to convert all the, uh, basically uh, reduce our dependence on petroleum, US consumes about 150 billion gallons of petroleum products every year. You can do the math and then figure out that we'll need a lot of biomass. And according to some of the DOE projection studies, there is about, about 500 to 600 million tons of biomass available every year that we can use to produce biofuels. By converting the biomass that is available in US uh, annually, we can produce about 35 billion gallons of ethanol that can be used to replace the gasoline. Now you have heard about the cellulosic ethanol, that we, uh, all the different technologies to convert cellulosic biomass into ethanol. This represents what is known as second generation biofuels. This is different from the first generation biofuels that is converting corn into ethanol. The first generation biofuels were basically cereal grains, converting them into fuels. And the second generation biofuels, these are converting the agricultural residue and other cellulosic biomass, which are not human food, to ethanol and, and other biofuels. The third and more uh, advanced biofuels, as we call them, uh, are, can be exemplified by algal biofuels. By this, the common pond scum that you see can, has about anywhere between 20 to 50 percent of it is lipids and it has a very high percentage of protein. So what we do is we take that algae, grow it in open ponds or in photoreactors as the case may be, and then convert that and then once we harvest that algae biomass, convert that into liquid biofuels. And we are investigating at OSU the different technologies are, uh, to convert algae uh, into biofuels. When we talk about biofuel, uh, the two things come into mind. The first one is ethanol and the second one is biodiesel. Biodiesel can almost be straight used in vehicles as such. And with respect to the ethanol, that is kind of a replacement for gasoline. And we can, at present, in fact, the gas that we buy at pump has 10% ethanol in it. And we can go up to 15% without any modifications to our vehicles. Uh, but as they have uh, shown in Brazil, we can actually, with uh, little modification to our engines, go up to 99% ethanol and run our vehicles purely on ethanol. At present, the biofuels are uh, really a medium-term, short-term and a medium-term solution. The reason being that we are looking for a lot of our transportation infrastructure at present is based on uh, liquid fuels. And once we transition to electrical fuels, we probably will not need a lot of these liquid fuels. But again, it's not possible to replace them overnight. So that's the reason why we are talking about these as a solutions in the medium term. And when we say this, it's also important to remember that just by putting ethanol in our gas tank, we cannot have a vehicle that will go like five miles a gallon. 
we still have to improve our efficiencies that still has to be done so these are only one of the strategies there is no real silver bullet in this and these are all one of the strategies and we have to pursue multiple strategies such as improving the vehicle efficiency alternative biofuels and uh, basically increasing the public transport even and doing things like that to reduce our impact on environment on the next episode of green science orient We'll visit Purolytics, an Oregon company that is pioneering a completely new photochemical technology for water purification. They'll show us their solar bag, which purifies three liters of pure drinking water in two to four hours of exposure to sunlight. They'll also demonstrate the Shield 500, which uses nanotechnology and semiconductor LEDs to purify contaminated water. We'll also check out some research being done at Oregon State University that's turning sewage water into electricity by growing bacteria that produces hydrogen to power fuel cells. All this while purifying water at the same time. The research being done could vastly improve water treatment facilities, provide electricity and drinking water to developing countries. This is a, a small microbial electrolysis cell we use to produce hydrogen from organic material. This technology can potentially be used to generate hydrogen from sewage or other type of waste streams. That's next time on Green Science Oregon.